that. What I want to do is I want to take you through what sounds a little boring logistics and manufacturing. And I want to tell you how in the last five to six years, the entire industry has transformed into knowledge networks and value networks and dynamic value networks, which is something John Gatorn and I put in a book uh, last year. It's not the traditional model, and everyone who stays focused on the traditional model will miss the future. It wasn't just Steve who drove the future. It's every business leader in every field. You have to see where the market is going, and you have to lead that transformation. And most, I will argue, still don't see what's coming. Dynamic value networks, and I want to tell you a little bit how boring logistics has become virtual and how manufacturing has become virtual and how all of this is moving into a new space of dynamic knowledge networks. So this is my theory. There's no pointer here, is there? Okay, maybe there is. Nope. Anyways, this is my theory. And if you look, this is traditional logistics. Warehousing, trucking, shipping, freight forwarding. And then you move to total logistics, and you have companies like Kuhn and Nagel, and DHL, and FedEx. And they're integrating the whole logistics activity, moving things between points. And they're monitoring it on computers, but it's still boring business, to be honest. Okay, that's how we all start. <coughs> then we evolve into supply chain management. And in supply chain management, it's sexy, it's unique, because we not only look at how to move products, we look at sales forecasting, the consumer globally. We look at the cost of capital and how capital moves and transforms. We look at raw material feeding factories. We look at labor within organizations. We look at something we never learn in universities, strategic change management. I have found the one thing, we all get a little taste of it at school, but strategic change management is that art of going into companies and driving transformation. And I don't remember having a class on it. The closest I got was cross-cultural communications for international managers. Strategic change management is that hidden tool that allows you to change organizations from within. McKinsey doesn't do that. You have to do that. So when you get into supply chain, you're actually doing a CAT scan of a company. And you're going in. I've, I've hired people from McKinsey. I've hired people from top consulting groups when I was in Lian Fung. We got in all different experts because you need all of those experts. You go into a company, you do a CAT scan, you analyze every part of the company, and then you get to restructure it to optimize the supply chain. And I will argue still today, it's a small number of companies who do real supply chain. But as, as we see in our industry, most companies now say they do supply chain management because it's really sexy. The guy who had a white truck, truck driving around in Singapore painted it logistics. And recently he painted supply chain management. But to me, it's still a truck. It's transforming. So now when you go to the future, you go to demand chain management. I'm doing a little bit of, of stuff with Dell right now, some friends over there. But Dell built that model, how they manufacture, and they can change the product while it's shipping to the consumer. You're going to see them repositioning their company again shortly with some radical changes. Walmart is now doing demand chain management. They're getting it to the point where you can pull an item off a shelf and literally it'll replenish within half an hour and it'll feed all the way back across the globe for replenishment. When I did the supply chain for McDonald's for uh, all of Asia, we had about, uh, at that time, about 8,500 restaurants. Now I think it's about 13,500. But we controlled that from Singapore for Asia. And we actually didn't control the supply chain. We actually did the replenishment everything. And we, every McDonald's restaurant had only one day inventory in Asia. It still does. And it's replenished in the middle of the night. And every country has only 7 to 14 days. So we used the Pacific Ocean as our main warehouse. The shipping lines didn't know that. It's demand chain management. And very few companies even know what it is. And my theory 
is we should be moving to dynamic value networks where the fixed and virtual assets cross-connect. And I'm going to not bore you with theories because you're still absorbing your hawker food from a half an hour ago. <laughs> I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to instead take you into case studies because that's what we all learn. And my mentor, Victor Fung, just like uh, your professors here, we know case studies are a little more interesting. But I just want to mention with knowledge networks, you're starting here. You're at this school because you already built networks to help position you. At this school, you're building a tremendous alumni network. I'm working uh, with the CEO of one of your companies who's building a brilliant business. Danny is building Amos International. I was just in Vietnam last week with another one of your alums from this school, Kyat, who's working in a Vista Hulahan Loki Investment Bank. So wherever I go, I keep running into University of Chicago alums. This is your network, just like, like I learned, leverage this network when you graduate and use it to your advantage. And then as you grow in your career, these are things that I found tremendously useful. The higher you go in business, the more networking and knowledge sharing becomes a differentiator. So the Clinton Initiative, Forbes Global CEO Conference, we had a couple weeks ago in Malaysia, the World Economic Forum, APEC Forum, uh, Horasis is a new thought leadership event for CEOs in Europe, Middle East, China, and India. These are events where maybe 300 people get together for two or three days and share ideas and brainstorm. And when you finish the event, what is that for? Okay. Oh, see, you guys are like, this is demand chain. I demanded this and it's already here. <laughs> Where, where's the pointer? Yeah. The middle. Okay. That was good. You guys are getting to band chain already. So as you rise in your career, do not underestimate in the new economy the value of networks. We were just at Forbes event, my partner and I, and just in that we have three or four networks for capital, for business deals. This is so important in the new economy more than it's ever been before. I'm going to forget that. Now it's stuck. <laughs> it's not a demand chain, it's stuck. And this does not count in my time zone, okay? Why don't you just get rid of it? Okay. Will it work? Thank you. Good, good try anyways. I have a laser pointer, I'm happy. So, so let's start. When we went to IDS Logistics, we had a $100 million facility in Singapore. I did an alliance with Customs. We put customs officers inside our building, and we decided to create something new called regional SCM hubbing. Yes, that's a real word now because I made it up. It's not misspelled. And what we did was we took this facility, which is 17 stories high, and the indoor working area is three and a half football fields, and we basically kidnapped cargo from around the world, the US, Europe, and all of Asia, and we, we basically linked all the factories into this facility, bonded, repackage, relabel, and then we feed it out just in time to 14 countries in Asia. We built case study with Sarah Lee and then Gillette and Diageo, Wines and Spirits, and everything. Uh, famous Fortune 500 companies, but we had to get two or three. And I'm going to give you a case study. We set up regional hubbing to use Singapore as a virtual center. Everyone in Asia thought that we had moved the factories here, but in fact, the factories could be anywhere in the world. We simply deployed the product and changed its form through Singapore. This is the supply chain of a Fortune 50 company. I won't tell you who it is, because I think he lost his job a year later. But this is how he controlled his supply chain. Every country had its favorite shipping line, forwarder, all of that. And then we created a company in Lian Fung where we basically inserted ourselves under the company and over all of the normal logistics companies and we took control of all of Asia without owning any assets. And then I linked them through that facility that you saw and this is what we did for Sarah Lee, Amber Pure Air Fresheners. 
and later all Sara Lee products, is we fed them through a hub. And I'm just using Ambipur as an example. This is years old. It's not confidential anymore. This is like seven, eight years. But they were producing out of Spain and Holland and shipping to 14 countries and having six to eight months inventory. So what we did was we said, let us control all the orders for every country in Asia. We'll control it in Singapore. And let us place orders on your own factories in Europe. We'll be responsible. And then we'll coordinate the whole shipping to feed it into Asia. And we'll use the shipping lines like floating warehouses. We'll stagger different shipping lines. And we'll use the water to play with working capital, which saves millions of dollars. And you never see it. And then we're going to store just the optimal amount of product in Singapore with customs on site. And then we're going to repackage and relabel just when Japan needs it, just when Korea needs it, just when China needs it, just when Thailand needs it, just in time and shoot it out. Three days to Bangkok, five days to Hong Kong, seven days to Shanghai, nine days to Tokyo. Guaranteed by water. Done. So why are you holding three months inventory, six months inventory? Millions and millions of dollars, lost market share. So we recreated it into this. And we used Singapore as the regional hub. And instead of taking three, two to three months to place an order in Europe and then make it and then ship it all the way to one country, and then you order too much or too little, we created one power center. And like a machine gun, we could just deploy rapidly across the region. And Ambipure increased sales by 300% the first year across all of Asia, and they became number one in market share. And everyone in the market thought they moved their factory to Singapore. But the factory is still in Spain. Then we replicated this with Gillette, with wines and spirits, tobacco, cosmetics, pharmaceuticals, electronics, everything. And this is where the Singapore government makes it easy. But